Well, having said that, we've been doing a series called Kingdom Now. We're talking this morning about freedom. You know, in every culture, there's a dominant characteristic. Let me just give you a quick example. You know, when you talk about, uh, let's say you go over to the nation of India, the dominant cultural value, believe it or not, in India, one of them, they have many, but one of them are pedestrians. Pedestrians rule the streets in India. The different cities I was in, it's not cars running around the streets, it's pedestrians, and they just move up and down, up and down the streets, filled from sidewalk to, through the street to the other sidewalk. There's tons of people that are just walking all around. Well, you'll find out that as you go through India, that if you are a driver, like they had this, this is a true story, I was reading the newspaper when I was there in India, a driver of a bus accidentally clipped a pedestrian. He proceeded to drive the bus down as far as he could, jumped out of the bus, and ran for his life because the rest of the pedestrians chased him because you do not touch a pedestrian in India. There is a value for people who walk along the roads and in the middle of the street, and if you touch them with your car, your scooter, your cab, whatever, your life is in peril. Now, if you take it to the United States, what is our value? Our value is the automobiles. And woe be to you if you get on the street on your bicycle or walking and a car comes by you. How many know that cars rule the roost? It's, it's a value. It's a, it's a cultural value that we have. Well, now let me come over to the kingdom of God. When I talk about the kingdom of God, most of us think about a place in heaven. Jesus called it the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And most of us misunderstand that it's not about going into eternity that Jesus wanted to bring the kingdom of heaven on earth. That's what we say the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So when you read the words of Jesus and you read the teachings of Jesus, he spent a lot of time talking in parables and talking about the kingdom of God. Growing up, and when I was growing up in church, I never heard much about the kingdom of God. I always thought it was when you died, you went to the kingdom and you know, went to heaven, and that was it. But God has a purpose for your life here on earth. God has a kingdom that he's establishing. In fact, the Bible says there's two kingdoms, the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. And there's no in-between. You're in one or the other. But God's kingdom is spiritual. So sometimes it's hard to see who's in what kingdom. You don't have clear discernment. You can't see that about every person. However, Jesus said, and he talked about that when you come into the kingdom of God, that you begin to take on the characteristics and the qualities of the king. And so when Jesus, and we went through this, is it, you know, talking about prayer and fasting and all these wonderful things. Once you know we've got like three days left after today, how I many know I'm not really counting it down? But it's about, you know, about 72 more hours and we're done. Not that I'm really worried about it. But anyway, the point is, is that when, we do pray, when you do times of prayer and fasting, let me just tell you what happens. Bad things happen that come out of your life because you think I'm fasting because I get closer to God. And sometimes it seems like God's moved a thousand miles away. When you're praying and fasting, I'm telling you, there's warfare that takes place in your mind and your emotions. There's all kinds of stuff that just comes up because God the Holy Spirit tells us that he's a fire. And when the fire of the Holy Spirit comes into your life, he begins to purge you of all the impurities that are in your life. There's all types of fears. Let me just stop on that. There's all kinds of fears that just grip us and control us. Some of you have a fear of being controlled. Some of you have a fear of failure. Some of you have a fear of rejection. Some of you just have a fear that you're going to die prematurely. Some of you have, you know, there's all these sometimes unbelievable fears that seem to just grab, grab us and they control our lives. And God the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and I that in his kingdom there's no room for that type of control in our lives. So when you're praying and fasting, God the Holy Spirit is working in partnership with you to get you free from the fears that control your life. I'll tell you another big area is rejection. It's amazing how many people walk around just have this spirit of rejection on them. And they always feel rejected. Could be the way they were born, could be the family genetics, you know, DNA, could be family curses passed down, it could be a lot of things that bring people in this thing, but rejection. You know what happens when you have rejection in your life? 
is that you treat others like you're rejecting them. Instead of accepting people and loving people and encouraging people the way Jesus did, you can't because rejection is controlling your life. Can I get an amen? There are times when you realize you go through life, if it's not fear and rejection, a lot of times it's just pride, ego, self-sufficiency. I'm my own man. I don't need anybody. You're deluded. We need people in our lives. In fact, when Jesus sent the disciples out, he never sent them solo. They always went at least in a team of two. And usually it was more than that. We need one another. You can go into this whole thing about the kingdom of God. So let me just talk to you just real quick about what Jesus did when he went, in, when he went into prayer and fasting. He was water baptized. We just saw the people this morning got water baptized. Jesus was baptized by his cousin John. Water baptized, it says the Holy Spirit came upon him. And it says that immediately the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. Now how many know that that's not a nice place to be in, the wilderness? And I can just tell you, when you start praying and fasting, it does feel like a wilderness. And you won't believe all the food commercials that come up on TV. It's unbelievable. Every time you turn around. In fact, you just look at magazines and all these pictures about food. You're just looking one after another, after another. It's just, it's amazing. And I'm just saying to encourage you, we got three days. We can finish strong. Maybe, you're, maybe food's not your deal. Maybe you need to fast social media. Maybe you got through some other issues. It's okay. Let God lead you. But I'm telling you, when you begin to pray and fast, you're amping up spiritual warfare in your life. So who wants to pray and fast? Let's just ignore it. Well, you'll find out when Jesus went in, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. When he came out of the wilderness, he came out in the authority of God because he overcame the temptations that Satan laid before him. There was an authority that Jesus had after he came out of the wilderness. And I'm telling you, there's a brokenness and there's an authority that God gives you when you overcome sin. There's just such a joy when you realize I don't have to be held into captivity to this anymore. You see, Satan is the master thief of deception. In other words, you think it's always you. You, think, you don't realize it's the devil. You don't realize it's his henchmen, his demons that are affecting you. You think it's you. And so by deception, he's able to control your mind, control your emotions, and control your thoughts because you think it's always you. But when you begin to pray and fast, God the Holy Spirit begins to separate you out from the stuff that's been in your life. And all of a sudden you realize, you know what, this really isn't fun. This is like going through some kind of deep-hearted surgery that God does in your life. God's setting you free from things you were born into. David said in the Psalms, he says, God, we were all born into sin. So every one of us, myself included, even Pastor Mitch, we're all born into sin. We all have stuff we have to overcome. And our greeting this morning, right before this service, is Sandra Scott did a great job of just sharing that, you know, all of us are going through stuff. Nobody's exempted. It could be a physical problem this morning. It could be a relational problem. It could be a monetary problem. It could be a psychological problem. It could be a drug addiction. Alcohol. It could be, I mean, this list is endless of all the stuff that people are going through. And when you come into Jesus and you understand his purposes for your life, he begins to want, the Spirit of God wants to set you free from the pressures that those things bring in your life. As we had our worship leader, Joe Bloom, just share with you, he says, we are fighting for a position of victory, not trying to get to victory. Two different things. And when you understand in Christ, you're victorious. So when Jesus, praying and fasting, walked into the wilderness, met Satan in mano a mano combat, the first thing the devil tempted him with was to give him this little two-letter word, if, if you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God, turn these rocks into bread. And that's the first question that hits you in spiritual warfare is God's really not your father. God's really not for you. You say you believe in Jesus, but look what happened to your life. Oh, yeah, you say you're going to follow Christ and then something bad happens? Well, you've got to get rid of the slave mentality, so to speak, or works getting to God. That doesn't work. Jesus knew because he'd been water baptized. The voice out of heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So the first area that Satan attacked was the very word of God. 
He attacked Jesus. He said, Jesus, you're not a son. If you're the son of God, turn these rocks, turn them into bread. I don't know about you, but 40 days of prayer and fasting, we are told that Jesus didn't have water or food. Supernatural fast. Do not try that on your own. You are not Jesus. And if you want to go to heaven quick, go 40 days without food or water, and you'll be in heaven real quick. Don't try it. You're supposed to take liquids and stuff. But Jesus went in and he met the devil face to face. Conquered the temptation. And that's the first thing we'll talk about is when Jesus came back, out of that three, three, three different temptations he faced, which is lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the boastful pride of life, all three temptations measure up with where our great-great-grandfather Adam failed in the garden. Jesus took the mantle, overcame sin, became a free man, walked free, was not controlled by his flesh, not controlled by his lust, not controlled by his pride. So Jesus walked free, and he came in, and the first message that Jesus preached, and this is what I want to get to, is in Matthew 4, 17, the first words out of the mouth of Jesus after this epic battle with Satan was repent for the kingdom of God is at hand or the kingdom of God is near. Or if I put in my words, the kingdom of God is available to you as a follower of Jesus. And Jesus talked about the kingdom of life. When you read through the very words that Jesus said, Jesus talked about the kingdom. Jesus spent the majority of his time preaching and teaching kingdom life and kingdom values. And I'm here to declare to you that it's not about getting to heaven. Kingdom life and kingdom values is about bringing heaven to earth. Kingdom values are about letting King Jesus and his Father rule in your life in such a way and rule in our life as a church that we can declare the kingdom of God has come into our midst. What does it look like? Well, John the Baptist said the same thing when he began to preach in Matthew 3, 1. He said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The first thing about repentance is to change the way you think. And if you think serving Jesus is a miserable life, you're sadly mistaken. However, I must apologize for us as church people. Because a lot of times we look miserable. A lot of times when we come to church, we look like we've been dipped in lemon juice. And we come walking in. And there's no joy, and there's no excitement, and there's no life. And yet Jesus said, I'm the source of life. And you know what's funny is I'm going through the scriptures, all these food scriptures keep leaving out at me. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. I don't know about you, but it's probably whole wheat, probably not white. But anyway, it was just... I could go through all these scriptures to deal with food. It's amazing how in your mind you're not thinking about food, all of a sudden you read the Bible and there it is. But the point is, is as you go through with Jesus... You realize that Jesus is the source of life. Hey, I'll give you a little secret. Jesus is fun to be with. Did you know that Jesus laughs? He's not the Mona Lisa of religion. You know what I'm saying? I mean, Jesus, Jesus loves to laugh. Jesus loves, if you will, I'll put it this way, Jesus loves to be included in your life. Now, how would you like to have a friend, the only time they called you is when they were in a crisis? I know after a while you're not answering the phone. After a while you're ignoring those texts. I don't see that. I'm sorry, I'm busy. So it is with the Lord. The Lord wants you to enjoy life, but he wants you to enjoy it with him. When you're talking about the kingdom of God, which is what Jesus proclaimed and taught, you begin to realize, you know what? God's got some amazing things in store for people who, uh, who repent and get their thinking right. We try to say this over and over again, and I'm not tired of repeating it. God is a good father Amen. with good plans and good intentions for your life. And if you will give yourself to him, put him first, he'll align the rest of your life, it'll work out. And you're not going to be plagued with all the, all the stuff that our culture is plagued with, the drug addiction and the alcoholism and the pornography and all the, the sordid uh, lifestyles that are going on that are creating havoc in the lives of the individuals that practice those things. And Jesus said the kingdom is now. You need to repent of the way you think because the kingdom is available right now. It's at hand. 
If something's at hand, it means if I say this Bible's at hand, it doesn't mean it's way out over there, it's over there. It means it's what? It's within reach, it's within grasp. Every single person has the opportunity to walk in the kingdom of God, to be a citizen aligned with the purposes of God, that you can enjoy the fellowship and the benefits of being in the kingdom of God. Here's the first benefit of the kingdom of God, it's freedom. Did you know when I talk about this, did you know that the Bible says that when you come into the kingdom of God, that God sets you free from sin, it will not be your master? And I'm telling you, when you begin to discover the wonderful freedom in Christ, you begin to realize that in Christ that I can be free from sin. You know, you think of some of the lifestyles that some of us have practiced in this room. Forget society, just in this room. We've had some miserable experiences. There are some things that I hope I never touch again with a 10-foot pole. How about you? I don't want to get close to that stuff. Yeah. There's, this, there's things that I just don't, I don't want to be close to. And yet when you come over into the kingdom of God, you begin to realize I do not have to be a slave to sin anymore. The Bible tells in Romans 6, 14, for sin shall not be your master. For you're not under the law, but under grace. Or sin shall not have dominion over your life. You know, there's something about serving Jesus to realize I don't have to be bound by fear. I don't have to be controlled by worry. I don't have to walk through life always trying to figure out what the next step is and being all stressed over what the future holds. God has a plan for my life. My enjoyment is to find his plan and to walk it out. You see, in the kingdom of God, every talent, every ability, every person counts. Nothing goes to waste in the kingdom of God. So no matter what career job you're doing or what, or what path you're on, if God wants to change you, you let him change it. But at the same time, you can enjoy the way God's made you, the way God's created you. You can walk in fellowship with him, and you can just relax knowing that God will get me to where I need to go. All you got to do is cooperate. Well, the first thing is you got to change the way you think. You got to realize that sin doesn't have to control your life. And no one ever preached or taught me this growing up in church. Mitch, you can be free from the control of sin. Let me talk about water baptism for a second. I'm just telling you, I've been on both sides of the fence. I got water baptized when I was six years old, you know, and I knew that Jesus had died for my sins. And all I knew about water baptism at that moment was that it was just a public confession of an inward faith. However, as I went to study scriptures later, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit as a teenager, began to speak in tongues, began to see all these spiritual gifts, but I never uh, felt like, I felt like God kept dealing about getting water baptized. I said, God, I've already been baptized. And God took me over to Acts 19, where there's disciples at Ephesus, and the Apostle Paul was preaching to them about baptism in the Holy Spirit, and they, and they said, we don't even know what you're talking about. And then Paul immediately took them over to water baptism. He says, and what were you baptized? And they said, with the baptism of John. John the Baptist baptized with the baptism of repentance. In other words, people were sorry for their past life. The baptism of Jesus is totally different. The baptism of Jesus is not only are you sorry, quote, for the past life, but it's a resurrection into a new life. It's a resurrection into a lifestyle where that you and Jesus are in the family of God, where you realize that you've been set free from your past. Will you realize it's no longer am I asking God to forgive me? And I'm always, every time I come to God, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. That's where I come to God and realize I'm in fellowship with God. My old life has been buried. And God began to deal with me about water baptism. And all I can tell you is that on a scale of 1 to 10, when sin came up, I was giving in at least 9 out of 10 times, if not a perfect 10 out of 10 times, temptation arose. Whether it be anger, pride, lust, greed, whatever, I was just giving in. And I can tell you, after water baptism, I began to pass. It started about six out of ten times. I got up to seven, eight. I was amazed how easy it was to overcome sin because I followed the steps of Jesus. And I'm telling you guys, it works. God has set it up to make it work so that walking in your Christian walk doesn't have to be hard. And for people who don't follow the words of Jesus, let me tell you what happens. It's like trying to run a race and you have a ball and chain attached to your ankle and you're wondering why you're going so slow and why it's so hard. Because you're not following the words of Jesus. That's all I can tell you. And we lay foundations and we share people. We try our best to communicate. 
Repentance is lordship of Jesus Christ. Water baptism, baptism of the Holy Spirit. Get me connected to a local church. Those are the foundations to help you grow. Let me go a step further. Might as well, since I'm already got everybody all excited. How many know that the church is not a business, but it's a family? We were listening to a video the other day, and it just talked about, you know, when you go to a restaurant, you expect to be waited on. You expect for people to come and take care of you. The food's bad, service is bad. You either complain to management or you just don't go back. Well, when you come into church, music's bad, preaching's worse, and people are not friendly. Too bad. This is called family. This is what happens when you get with family. They may not treat you nice all the time. Yeah, family. Some of you have dysfunctional families. I'm talking about just, just regular dysfunctional families. You know, like when you talk about chores. And you talk about as a parent. My children would argue. I talked about this at first service. My children would argue over who had to load the dishwasher. Really? Take you five minutes to take the few dishes we have, put them in the dishwasher, you're done. They would argue with each other over whose turn it was that had to go to the dishes, to put them off the table, put them in the dishwasher. They spent more time arguing over whose job it was to do it at that time than if they'd just gone and done it. But you know, in the church, in the church, God has tasks for you. There's responsibilities. You're part of the family. You don't get a free ride here. You're not here just to sit in the seat and mooch off everybody else. We're not a business. We're family. Get busy. Find your place. Get you, and then you don't get even pats on the back. People just, you know what? It's like I was telling this one guy, he was, he was talking about some of the things that at Thanksgiving dinner that he was given the chore. He's been doing it for like 20 some odd years, cutting the sweet potatoes. And they make this sweet potato casserole. He talked about all this stuff. Well, you know what? People who come and do setup on Saturday nights and they're working, working, working. You know what? They don't get a lot of thanks from this stuff, but you know what? They can look and they see parts of the stage that they set up. They can look around and see different chairs that they set up or different things they've done. And they kind of have that because they're just, they're in the family. And if you want to feel like you belong, you got to be part of the family. Let God use your gifts and talents to be a blessing to others. Find a way that you can give and share. Find a way that you can just simply get your eyes, if you would, off yourself. I've been saved and called with a holy calling, a noble purpose. I always have people say, well, you know, what can I do? Well, if you really want to do something special, open up your house and have people come over and you can do Bible studies. We've got videos on Right Now Media. You can download them. You can have them available. It's like Netflix or Christian stuff. They've got every video, every teaching you want. You can pull it in, get some friends together and say, hey, let's study the Word of God. Let's pray for one another. Let's encourage one another in our walk with God. Let's just do something for God. Let's do something for his kingdom. Amen. But no, we like, to, we like for the church to be a business. <laughs> and I'm just here just to encourage you. The hope of the world is the local church. And if the local church loses its family feel and we become a business, I think we've lost our mission. Because Jesus told us, disciples. He says, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. He pulls them in. In fact, we read the second thing. It says that are you, not only are you free from sin, but the Bible tells us another value in the kingdom is you're free to become a son or a daughter of God. Amen. Listen to what it says in Galatians 4. We read this verse to you. It says this. It says that and because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So there's a progression. First of all, we were slaves to sin. Jesus comes into our life and sets us free from our slavery to sin, whatever that sin was. Then God moves you over into a place where he's trying to help you identify that we're, we always have this mentality, we want to work for God. Work for God, work for God. That's like a servant mentality. And God wants to move you from being a servant. God wants to move you into a place to where that you become a son or a daughter of God. But listen, it gets even better. There's one more thing here. God tells us that it's more than just being a son or a daughter of God. Listen to me, church. The Bible tells us that God moves us into being co-heirs with Christ. The same authority 
The same relationship that Jesus had with the Father is making available to you, the believer. In fact, it's such a powerful revelation. The Bible tells us in Romans 8, 11, the very same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will now come to live in you. If the spirit of God could conquer death through Jesus, how much more can the spirit of God in you get rid of those measly little fears that grip your life? How much more can the Spirit of God get rid of that rejection and depression and all that stuff that just weighs us down that we just fight against and fight against and fight against? As Joe said, we're fighting for a position of victory. Through Christ, I become a co-heir. Through Christ, he sets me free from these debilitating fears. Through Christ, I have this journey of faith. That as I watch, as I walk with him, faithfully persevering to walk with him and to obey him, he teaches me, he guides me, and he cleanses me and sets me free. All I can tell you is that in my years of serving God, his hand has never left me, and he's never quit dealing with stuff in my life. I don't know that I've ever come to a place where I've, quote, arrived. That's why I pray and fast. Because God just shows me that you're not as spiritual as you think you are. Just because you don't get your food doesn't mean you get to yell at your wife. Just because you don't get your food doesn't mean you get to be grouchy. And you go through these issues and you realize, God, I just need more of you, not less. As I'm getting older, it's like, God, I am more dependent on you, not less dependent on you. And you know what? There's such a freedom that comes when you realize that your life is in his hands. The Bible is very clear. It says that we, our very breath is derived from him. In him we live and move and have our breath, have our being. Everything we have is from him. We like to think we're self-sufficient. We're really not. You know one of the biggest responsibilities you have when you get this freedom? It's self-control. You know, right now when you're fasting, you've decided there's certain foods you're not going to eat. Funny, I keep talking about fasting. But even when you're fasting, you keep talking, you, just, you realize there's certain foods. But you know what? When you're not fasting, you're free to eat anything you want. You have to have self-control over how much you want to eat. And it takes, in my opinion, it takes more self-control when you're free than when you're fasting. The hardest part about a fast is not really so much the fast, it's coming off the fast. When you realize, man, I can eat anything, and you just start, your eyes light up, and you're just ready to go. I have some friends, i got to tell you a quick story. I had some friends that decided they were going to do a liquid-only fast. You would not believe the amount of stuff that fits in a blender. <laughs> you know, you could put steak in a blender. <laughs> Protein. And then I had friends, they were timing down their fast. They decided they were going to fast before God. They would go to the local restaurant, and they'd wait down to the final minute. They would tell the waitress, at this time, you're going to put this food on the table. And they'd be all set. They couldn't wait till the fast ended so they could start eating. I understand that. It's kind of humorous. But you know, when you become free, self-control becomes a vital part of that freedom. Perseverance becomes a vital part of that freedom. I'm free to do anything I want to do, except when it comes to areas of relationships with other people. The Bible is very clear that if my food or drink offends you, I need to forego my food or drink so I don't offend you. You see, my freedom is not an opportunity for me to impose upon you, in a sense, I'll say my values. Freedom is all about serving others. Freedom is all about giving to others. Freedom and working and living as a free people is all about putting others first, myself second. That's the freedom. That's the joy. That's the responsibility we have as followers of Christ. And that's what makes it such a joy to serve Jesus. Because when he frees you up, you can go through life and you're not all stressed out. You can just enjoy each stage of your life. You know, growing up, I think one of my problems was I always wanted to get older. 
I couldn't wait to get out of single digits into double digits. I couldn't wait to get my driver's license. I couldn't wait to go to college, to get married. Couldn't wait to have kids. Now I can wait till I die. Okay, I don't want that one too. I'll put that one on. But as you go through each, and like in each stage, you're always looking to the next stage. Can I get to the next stage? You know what? You, you miss out on life. God wants you to enjoy life. wants you to be free. Yes. wants you to walk in such a way that you realize, God, you've set me free. Jesus, you have come into my life. As we say in John 8, our last scripture, if we talk about this, Jesus, whom the Son sets free, is free indeed. Jesus, when you come into my life, you set me free. I don't have to have a secret addiction to pacify or medicate myself. I can be free. I don't need that ice cream. Another food story. I don't need that ice cream. I don't need that drug. I don't need that alcohol. I don't need that relationship. Jesus, I am free in you. Amen. And because I'm free in you, God, I am free to be your servant, yes. to serve others and minister to others because I'm your son. You know, my kids, they're all adults now, but I'm telling you, when they come into the house, you know, they don't ask permission to go to the refrigerator. They haven't lived there in years. <laughs> they walk in like they own the place. Walk around, use our stuff, do all this stuff, do all these things. In fact, it's funny. I know family, you fall back into relationships. We all still depend on Rebe to do all of our cooking and cleaning. It's amazing. <laughs> you guys have been out of the house forever, and we're still doing the cooking and cleaning. They just, well, you're still my parents. You know, you're still my dad, still my mom. So, yeah, have at it. <laughs> well, how about you go load the dishwasher then? Then I'm going to argue with each other. <laughs> you go through all this stuff, and I'm just saying it's just a journey. But the joy, the freedom that you have in Christ, that's what I'm proclaiming this morning. Yeah. And that's the word of the Lord for us is it's freedom. As a citizen in God's kingdom, he's called us to be a free people. Yeah. So as we bow our heads this morning, we're closing up as we bow our heads. Just want you to search your hearts and say, God, is there anything in me? Is there anything in me that's creating some tension, pressure, fears, worries, anxieties? some dread? Is there some things in my life that's causing me to not be a free man or a free woman? And then you begin to realize that, God, you've got some incredible adventures for my life. Lord, I need to repent for wrong thinking. God, I need to repent for not allowing the kingdom of God to be the central focus of my life. I've been focused on other issues. God, thank you this morning that I could come and realize that the kingdom of God is to be established in my life that I've been put into a local family, that I'm here to serve, here to be a blessing, here to be a part, that you want to set me free, clean me up, get me free from all my debilitating fears so that I can represent you, Jesus, to my culture. Father, I pray for us as a community of faith. Father, I just pray for us as a church. Tell you what, why don't you guys stand up with me? We'll just end on this because I feel like this is so strong. I feel like a, we have a ministry team here. They can come forward. I have this strong sense as we pray this morning just for that freedom. And there's many people here that are not free. I'm going to pray for you again. and have you raise your hands in just a moment. The ministry team gets in place. But let me just say this morning, if you're struggling with some areas in your life and you say, Pastor Mitch, I want you to pray with me. Let's just break the fears or break the, the things that are controlling my life that I know are not from Jesus. Let you just raise your hand and let's believe God for breakthrough this morning for your life, whatever it may be. Let me look around. See these hands, see these hands, see these hands, see these hands. See these hands. That's good, that's good. This is between you and God. Saying, God, just thank you this morning. Thank you this morning, Jesus. I'm not going to be controlled or be a slave any longer. God, I'm going to walk as a free man, as a free woman. God, this morning, I'm going to walk in the freedom that you, Jesus, purchased for every child, every person on planet Earth. My life does not have to be controlled by these things anymore. Father, in the name of Jesus, you see every hand that was raised, even hands that weren't raised. But, Father, we thank you this morning that you've come to set the captives free. Father, we pray right now in Jesus' name that you would break every demonic-held fear in Jesus' name. Lord, I come against every spirit of rejection. I come against every spirit of deception. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name that we can have a clear clear, unmistakable view of who you are and what you've done. Father, we thank you that sin will no longer dominate our lives. We thank you, even as Joe shared earlier this morning, that, Lord, we're not fighting to get victory. We're walking in victory. We're fighting from victory. 
Father, we thank you that because we're co-heirs with Christ, we rule and reign with you in this life. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name that we'll have a free people and a free church in Jesus' name. You know, if you're here this morning, you've never given your heart to Christ, let me just tell you, it starts with just a journey of faith. We just pray a prayer that I'm going to pray for you. I want you to pray this with me, saying, Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to cleanse me. I ask you to be my Lord and Savior. The same spirit that was in Jesus will come and be in your life. You can be a part of the family of God. You can be a part of the, establishing the kingdom of God on earth. You can be a part of letting God use your gifts and talents and abilities to a maximum way that gives him great joy and pleasure. Let us help you partner with you in your gift, in your words of faith and your life of faith as you continue to journey with him. Let me just stop this and just say, church, with our heads bowed, this Lord, I pray for this congregation. Lord, I pray that you would bless them. Father, I pray in these last three days of prayer and fasting, Father, you'd equip them, cover them, anoint them. That, Father, as they're in spiritual warfare, Father, let them walk out victorious. Lord, let them be like sons and daughters of God, like Jesus was in the wilderness. They can beat the devil, meet the devil head on and beat him and overcome temptation and all the fleshly uh, enticements that are out there. Father, we proclaim victory as a church in Jesus' name. And everybody said a big amen. amen. Let's give the Lord a big hand. Amen. Amen, amen.